Good morning. On today's walk, we're going to talk about wealth management. We all have an intuitive sense of what the practice involves, but I've come to find that most people are being misled by that intuition. They confuse wealth managers with, with like day traders, folks who spend all day in their underwear buying and selling GameStop. In reality, wealth managers are more like relationship managers who get to know you, your family, and your financial goals, and then match those goals with a bunch of hand financial services, which I'll rattle off in a second. Wealth managers, for the most part, aren't going to manage your investment portfolio, at least not actively. Trading, you know, every day, that's what I mean by active management. They're just going to guide you to manage financial products, think mutual funds or ETFs, you know, if you're middle class or that and alternative investments, if your net worth is higher than say $10 million. Even the more elite wealth managers you'll meet are not traders. They're usually like tax experts or or lawyers who specialize in estate planning. If you don't have those skill sets and you still aspire to, to be a wealth manager, well, you better love people. And the act of listening to their goals, to stories about their family, because most of what you'll do every day is that. And, you know, administrative BS on their behalf. There, done. Shortest walk ever. Go be a wealth manager. <laughs> Still here? Okay, fine. I'm going to spend most of the rest of this walk deconstructing something called robo-advisory to give you a sense of the kinds of conversations you should have as a wealth manager, and more importantly, why you'd have them. If, if, if you don't know what robo advisors are, there are a class of websites that let you manage your investments with minimal human intervention. You play a game of 20 questions with the website's bot, and based on your answers, the bot provides a formulaic suggestion about what your asset allocation should be. If you like its advice, you can give it your real money or some of your real money, and it'll invest that money in a way that algorithmically aligns with your answers. Kind of cool, actually. Not holistic wealth management, but it's an important part and great for introverts. Deconstructing the questions that, that robo-advisory bots ask is useful even if you don't want to become a wealth manager because through the questions, which I have, again, printed out, and I will read 10 of them. But through those questions and why they're being asked, well, that can make you a better financial planner for you and your family. Okay, so enough preamble. Make sure I don't trip on the rocks. When you, when you sign up for a robo-advisory with a company like Wealthfront or Betterment or any large bank, really. The first thing the online system is going to do is ask you a lot of the same questions that a human financial planner would ask in your first face-to-face -face sit down. Because they're both trying to do the same thing. Figure out where you are right now financially, where you want to be, and how much risk you can stomach on that journey. The advisor, whether robo or not, will ask about a dozen questions to get you to the heart of your relationship with your money. Questions like your financial goals, your investment objectives, your time horizon for significant life events, like, like how long before your kids go to college or how long before you retire. And they use that information your risk tolerance to help you balance your portfolio, to always have what's called a balanced 
asset allocation, which is a fancy way of saying how much of your investable money should be in stocks, bonds, and, you know, short-term reserves. Your, your, your bank account, your money market instruments, U.S. Treasury bills, money that you can spend without paying a penalty for withdrawing it. The whole process is hopefully a thoughtful matching of your goals and your mindset. And as your financial circumstances or goals change, you'll want to revisit the allocation process to adjust your answers to the questions. So your human advisor or the robo system knows how to reallocate the investments in your portfolio. Understanding the questions that, that you'll get asked, super useful. Two big ways, right? One, you're deepening your knowledge of personal finance. Yours. And two, you're scratching the surface of the value of wealth management as a practice. I say scratching the surface because wealth management is so much more than your asset allocation. It's about taxes, legal structures, estate and family planning, education planning, philanthropy, and on and on and on. I'll, I'll try to cover that in the second part of the of the walk if it's, if it's not as wet as this. But what I want to do, at least in the first 30 minutes, is to deconstruct that, that robo, that first step in wealth management, to see what we can learn by prosecuting the questions that a robo advisor asks, to try to understand how and why you'd want to rebalance your portfolio. The word rebalance, by the way, is, uh, is industry jargon. It's, it's used in, in two ways, technical, philosophical. Technically, a rebalance is doing whatever it takes to keep your asset mix in line with your goals. Example, let's say that your portfolio mix is like 60% stock, higher risk, 30% bonds, lower risk, and 10% cash or cash reserves and opportunity loss risk. So 60, 30, 10. Now, let's say that your stocks outperform. Yay. They do so well that they organically change those proportions to 70, 20, 10. 70% 70 stock, 20% bonds, 10% cash. An automated rebalancer, something every robo-advisory has, would sell whatever it needs to and buy whatever it needs to, to, to get your portfolio's proportions from your 70, 20, 10 back to 60, 30, 10 rebalancing. There's also a more philosophical use of that word. For instance, when, when something is changed on your end, like you have new financial objectives, or your life has transformed in some significant way, well, that change should trigger adjusting your asset mix, potentially. The underlying percentages, that 60, 40, 10 in that example, that dynamic. So rebalancing can also mean refreshing your goals and how they determine the percentage of your investments in each asset class. Hey. Given how your life has changed since you first answered those questions, you know, is it time to take more risk? Socks as an asset class, as I said. Or less risk? Bonds as an asset class. And again, sadly, there isn't a no risk option <laughs> because keeping your money in your checking account means that its value is going down. I think inflation, or opportunity risk. Regularly reviewing and rebalancing your portfolio can help ensure that it stays aligned 
with your goals and risk tolerance over time. You can do that with regular visits to your human advisor or by retaking the online survey at your robo-advisor. The point here is that by answering the questions we're about to review, uh, the questions asked by any financial planner, robo or human, you get insight into how your own money, if you're not a financial planner, or the money of others, if you aspire to be a financial planner, can be better managed. Okay, so let's get into the questions that robos ask. And I'll try to frame them, or at least I've, I've printed them out so that I'm reading them for, for me, right? So question one, when making a long-term investment, I plan to keep the money invested for two years or less, three to 10 years, more than 10 years. Okay, so why would a good financial planner ask this first question? Time is relative. And I'm not talking about some Einsteinian notion that the rate at which time passes depends on your frame of reference. I'm talking about how in, in my 20s, my idea of taking a risk was like rock climbing. Now, in my 50s, it's, it's throwing out a box of old Apple chargers. That's risky. You know, you never know when you'll need one of those old ones. Uh, but because I'm old, I can probably afford a new one if I ever need one. Less risk-taking. What does that have to do with making a long-term investment? Well, in my 20s, the word long-term meant something different to me than than they did in my 30s, 40s, and now 50s. So defining and redefining the idea of long-term and all its fluid complexity is key to a good financial planning conversation. It matters in what time frame you want to start withdrawing and spending the money locked in your investments. And not just because some asset classes have time locks, i.e. like early withdrawal penalties like CDs, certificates of deposit that charge you for early withdrawal, because they have what's called a fixed maturity. Okay, I'll stop getting into it. Look, it, a fixed maturity is a, it's a fancy term for you can't take it out of the oven before a certain amount of time has passed. It's like delving into jargon, into jargon, into jargon, whatever. Even if no asset types had fixed maturity. Defining what just long-term means to you is important. Your, your time frame is one of the two most important dimensions of your asset allocation, the other being your risk tolerance. Financial plans aren't a theoretical exercise. You're mapping out your investment strategy that should be grounded in your time frames. If your time frame is short, go with a uh, more conservative allocation to preserve your, your assets. Less of the kind of short-term volatility that comes with stocks. And if you won't need the money for a while, go with a more aggressive allocation, i.e. more stocks, because that gives your assets the potential to grow over time and gives you a little bit of shock absorbers for when things go a little little south. You can wait it out. As a pattern, <clears throat> this first question is important because it teaches you that communicating about investments starts with having the planner and the plan E uh, speak the same language. That's worth any amount of time you spend on it. Because we all use the same words and they don't all mean the same thing. They should, but they don't. Okay, question two. As I withdraw money from my investments, I plan to spend it throughout two years or less, that's short-term horizon, three to 10 years, medium-term horizon, more than 10 years, that's a long-term horizon. 
why would a good financial planner ask this question? Because life gets in the way. You might be thinking about buying a house in two years, or your kids might be three years away from graduating high school, and you want to help pay their way through college. Your car might mean nearing its, its end of life. You know, these things are going to cost you, and so your financial plan needs to take them into account. Is the question meant to have you predict the future? Of course not. This isn't about planning for that eventual car accident or, you know, the pleasant surprise of having a child that you weren't planning to have. It's, it's about what you know and can predict. Because every time you withdraw money from your investments, you're, you're withdrawing their future gains. And accounting for that, when you know that your future involves a home purchase or tuition costs or, you know, insert whatever your big ambitious spends are, then the plan can build around those challenges, take them into account. So you're not left at age 65 with a home-sized hole, a tuition-sized hole. Because in retirement, you want to be sure your money will last as long as needed. My answer on this, by the way, when I, when I took the, the robo thing was three to 10 years, the medium term. Why? I'm in my early 50s, and I'll need to start spending my savings when I retire in, you know, 10 years. If you're in your 20s or 30s, your time frame will be shorter, not longer. At least mine was. You'll, you'll need to account for starting a business or two, getting married once or twice or three times, having kids if you, if you want to stay poor, buying a nice home, etc. That's the irony. I won't need the money for 10 years because all my expensive events are behind me. It's privilege of having grown old. Good financial plan needs to account for all major life events in the future, whether that's the near, medium, or long-term. A good plan will use that information to suggest an allocation that will give your assets the chance they need, the, the potential to grow over those periods. The next question is an important add-on to the one we just covered, which was as I withdraw my money from my investments, I plan to spend it over a period of. So question three, I plan to begin, that's the key word, begin, taking my money from my investments in two years or less, short-term horizon, three years, medium-term horizon, more than 10 years, long-term horizon. The last question was asking, for how long do you need to stretch your money? This question is asking, when do you think that'll start? Why would a good financial planner ask this question? If an airplane pilot doesn't know how long their runway is, you'll end up in a ditch. It's super important that you at least try to estimate the amount of time you have until you start spending the money you're investing. Again, if that's a short runway, you need a more conservative allocation to preserve your assets. Longer runway, you can be patient as you taxi in that plane. Then you'll have more money after takeoff, for sure. Question number four. When it comes to investing in mutual funds or ETFs or individual stocks or bonds, I would describe myself as completely clueless, my words, high-level understanding, or, you know, move over, I got this. 
Again, my words, not the actual question. Why would a good financial planner ask this question? Most wealth managers, as I said early on in the walk, don't actually buy you specific stocks and bonds unless you're clueless enough to ask them. Instead, they help you figure out what your asset mix should be, like that 60-30 mix that we talked about at the front of the walk. And then they fill those percentages with managed products. Not managed by them, but by the large professional money management firms. You know, think BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, State Street, JP Morgan. So whether you're the uh, investor or the financial planner, you need a good understanding of the product classes that you're either about to own or about to sell. At a minimum, you need to understand mutual funds and ETFs. So I described what mutual funds are in detail on one of my previous walks, the one called Fund Accounting in Chef Shawan, Morocco. I don't remember if I've done that kind of detailed analysis for ETFs or exchange traded funds, ETFs. You know what? Let's just do it. ETFs are a type of investment fund, uh, an exchange traded product with shares that are tradable on stock exchanges. ETFs are usually designed to track the performance of a specific index, commodity, bond, or asset class. But as the industry has matured, there are lots of interesting, I guess that's the right word, other rationales for the makeup of, of ETFs. One example, ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, ESG. ETFs, um, those are driven by, you know, wanting to make the world a better place. They're trying to appeal to investors who strongly believe in their personal values and an environmentalist at heart. ESG lets you invest in companies that align with your values. Point is that ESG moves past a blind commitment to a standard index by capturing all the non-financial risks and opportunities inherent to a company's day-to-day -day activities. Or you can go the other way, right? With, with what's called a vice ETF, filled with companies whose products may, may be bad for you, but they end up being good for your wallet, maybe. Think tobacco, alcohol, gambling, that worst of all evils, bitter, dark chocolate. Mm. And it's not just ESG and Vice that reimagine the organizing themes of an ETF bundle. There's some really crazy stuff out there. That's a good example. There's a, there's a TV personality here in the States named Jim Cramer. Um, he's a former hedge fund manager turned TV nut job. And whether you love him or hate him, there's an ETF designed for you. The, the two ETFs released earlier this year, like in March, they track the stock predictions he's made on his show. And the ETF either follows his recommendations, you know, the ETF's called Long Kramer ETF, or does the opposite, the inverse Kramer ETF. I'd be wary, because the idea of, you know, celebrity as financial advisor is as good as, you know, celebrity as president. Good people on both sides. All right, back to ETFs. The, the, the main value of ETFs to investors, aside from being managed by professionals, is that they're a way to diversify your holdings. How do they do that? Most ETFs are filled with a wide range of underlying assets. The other big value is that unlike mutual funds, ETFs can be bought and sold throughout the trading day. 
similar to individual stocks. This, this gives investors with, well, it provides them with flexibility, liquidity, in managing their investment portfolios. The point here with question number four is that the usual next step, unless you're rich or super rich, is to fill those percentages with high-performing, values-aligned, highly liquid ETFs and mutual funds. Okay, let's move on. Question number five. My current and future income sources, like my salary, social security, pension, etc., are unstable, somewhat stable, very stable. Why would a good financial planner ask this question? On the face of it, this question is about making sure that all the numbers you're working with are solid as you're planning. If you're filling in a metaphorical spreadsheet that adds and subtracts and calculates more complicated things like compound interest, you want to make sure your base numbers are as correct as reasonably possible. Scratch a little deeper, and you realize that if your answer is anything other than very stable, it's a great conversation starter, right? What do you know about, about your life that your plan or your planner doesn't? Maybe your future income sources are, you know, somewhat stable because you might not be at your current company past a certain date, or maybe it's somewhat stable because your industry is shrinking. There are a million aha moments in, in this question for the planner and for the client. Your plan doesn't, you know, go to hell if your current or future income sources are unstable, but it does need to change. Your, your asset mix, for instance, <clears throat> I think this is like the third time I'm saying this, could be more conservative or aggressive depending on the stability of your current or future income sources. Stable numbers will obviously make for a more solid foundation and they'll give you more opportunity to take on investment risk with higher potential returns. That doesn't mean that your investment strategy is, is hopeless without that stability. It just means you have to be, you know, more conservative less risk-taking to better serve your long-term interests. Plus, asking the question and, and hopefully asking a ton of follow-up questions if you're a human advisor helps ground both sides in a commitment to revisit the plan when that thing you're afraid of in your future changes. And you'll be less fearful because you've talk through its impact on your, on your portfolio, your asset allocation, your future. Okay. Question number six from, oh, from early September of last year through October of last year, bonds lost 4%. If, if I owned a bond investment that lost 4% in two months, I would sell it all, sell a portion, hold tight, or buy more. There's usually one of these questions for every asset type that you might be getting into. For instance, I wrote another one. That was about, the first one was about bonds. The second one pulled from another robo site, the stock version from September of late last year to November. Stocks lost over 31% if I owned a stock investment that lost about 31% in three months, I would, same thing, sell it all, sell a portion, hold tight, or buy more. Notice, by the way, that the risk of the asset type is built into the question in both cases. So in, in the bonds example, you lost, what, 4%? and in the stocks, you lost 31% over two months. So volatility built into questions. I won't do one for every potential asset class, but you get the picture, right? 
why would a good financial planner ask these kinds of questions? First, they're planting a seed about product volatility and market volatility, which is wise because people make bad investment decisions when they think in the short term, when, you know, they're driven by uncertainty, fear. The heart of the question, though, is to understand your risk tolerance when things get tough. How well do you know yourself during times of market volatility? When there are, you know, unpredictable swings that might dramatically change the value of your investments. How do you act? How would you like to act? No one's judging you in these kinds of questions. If you have a hair trigger, that ain't going to change when your advisor uses his calming voice, right? But knowing that you have a hair trigger or that you're a long-termer, right, is, is a key factor in finding your, let's call it temperament-aligned asset mix. You don't need someone to keep telling you that taking on more risk can lead to higher returns. You just need to be honest with yourself about, one, how you react to it. Two, how you wish you'd react to it. Because then, your logic and aspirations can be baked into the algo that's making programmatic decisions about your money. That, for me, is the best thing about Robo. No judgment. I'm not trying to change you. It's just, it's just asking you what would make you most comfortable during times of volatility. And then automating that mindset. It's baking your specific risk tolerance into the logic that buys, sells, and holds your investments. If you run when the sky is falling, it runs with you. Hell, it runs ahead of you if you aren't watching the news. If you double down when threatened, it mimics your bravado. It stays true to you or me or who we aspire to be. And that gives me, at least, remarkable peace of mind. Okay, let's move on. Question number seven. So this, this, this one's weird. It's, it's usually a picture that tries to visually trigger your appetite for swings in your portfolio, upward and downward. The picture will, will show you the greatest one-year loss for a portfolio as compared to its highest gain for that same year. And I'll do that across a handful of different hypothetical investments of a fixed amount of money, say $10,000, right? I think of it as, a, as, as turbulence on a plane. All the pictures are, are, are trying to ask, on that spectrum of turbulence, where are you? Are you like mild turbulence? When your seat just shakes a little, means that you'll make X returns, but you might also lose X. And then the other end of the spectrum is, is like wild turbulence. You're, you know, thumping up and down, almost hitting your head on the ceiling. The baggage compartment opens up above you, dropping luggage onto your head. Babies flying everywhere, cats and dogs living together. And all that means that you'll make some 5X returns or you know, the oxygen masks will drop and you'll lose 5X. That's what the pictures are all trying to convey. Those ranges spark a good conversation about your risk appetite when you see them. The, the conversation will be about how much volatility can you stomach. Minimum, moderate, or hold on to your seats. Okay, the next several questions, eight, nine, and 10, they're statements more, more than questions. And you'll see them on a lot of robo questionnaires. And your response has to be on a spectrum of, you know, strongly agree at one end to strongly disagree at the other end. You, you've seen that, you know, they usually, most people pick the middle on almost everything. Actually, that's not true. A lot of people do the whole end to end to end only picking fives or zeros. 
Okay, question number eight. During market declines, I tend to sell portions of my riskier assets and invest money in safer assets. Why would a, why would a good financial planner ask this question or pose this statement? It's, it's one part gauging risk appetite, risk tolerance, and one part trying to mimic the underlying behavioral habit of the client. How would they feel if they saw a sudden change in their account balance, positive or negative? It's a variation of the themes we talked about in the last two questions, right? Market volatility and your behavior during upward and downward swings. <clears throat> if we've learned one thing during this walk, it's that your risk tolerance is the single most important element in finding your right asset mix. What do you do when the market's up or down? Do you stay on target or change a target? And how comfortable are you with those, with those decisions, with that risk? That, you know, because it's, it's, it's a mitigation strategy at the end of the day. Some of us prefer a portfolio that stays on a more even keel because we value yeah, peace of mind. Others of us prefer more heartburn or at least more heartburn now for higher rewards later. There's a standard asset allocation for, for every answer in that spectrum. <clears throat> okay. Another spectrum question, question number nine. I would invest in something based solely <laughs> on a brief conversation. I love the, the term brief on a brief conversation with a friend, coworker, or relative. Why would a good financial planner ask this question? And in this particular way, it's, it's harder, not impossible, but harder to manage an investment portfolio. If the client keeps changing their long-term strategy, that's why the question is framed as a brief conversation with a friend. It's virtue signaling or financial virtue signaling. I, the advisor know that you, the client are not impulsive, that you do your homework, that, you know, you're smart enough to know good advice when you, you know, not just hear it, but research it. It isn't asking a really obvious question. So, so much as planting some seeds, anchoring the client. To be fair, no one I've ever met is actually stupid enough to answer this question with complete honesty. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a complete flake when it comes to, to money. Impulsive, I hate doing my own homework. I take pride in the fact that I can't differentiate between smart and dumb money. Like, no one says that. They would, they would, if they were honest and self-aware, that's a pretty high bar, right? Okay. Question number 10, another spectrum question. The final spectrum question. Generally, I prefer an investment with little or no ups and downs in value. And I'm willing to accept the lower returns these investments may make again some well-intentioned psychological manipulation, a little anchoring, but ultimately trying to refine the client's comfort with risk and volatility. Okay. So those are the 10, you know, questions. They're not the exact questions. They're a decent representation of the kinds of questions you'll get asked. Every single service will also ask about your, your current asset allocation, they have to ask that because they'll assume as I would, that they're not your only investment advisor slash service. And they want to make sure you're not planning in a vacuum. No advisor, robo or human assumes that you've been living in a box, that this is the first time you're investing. So they'll ask you to enter how much of what you're already invested in is in stocks, bonds, cash outside of them, right? Outside of this particular advisor or robo service. 
essentially your current asset allocation as a percentage of all your investments everywhere. They're going to need to know that. Not, you know, for, there's, there's good reason. Like, why would a good financial planner ask this question? Everyone I know uses more than one bank, more than one advisor, because, and then not because banks suck or advisors suck, but because it's become a common practice to diversify across multiple providers. And your asset allocation at advisor number two shouldn't, you know, ignore what you have at advisor number one. Or if, if this advisor is, is your first asset allocation, shouldn't ignore the stocks your company issued you or the bonds your grandparents bought you or the portfolio you inherited. When you're talking to your advisor, human or robo, when you answer all the kinds of questions we've been talking about, there's a very good chance that your ideal allocation percentage will be, you know, roughly 60% stocks, 30% bonds, 10% cash or short-term reserves. If you don't factor in all the stock you've already, you know, invested in elsewhere, you'll be overweighted in stocks. Hence the question. Okay. By the way, the, uh, I would show you, and I am showing you uh, the shot of the city, but it's, it's hard to actually it's not a good shot because of all the wildfires. Okay, so what have we learned about or from a prosecution of robo questions? Most of the questions on this walk have been about your appetite for risk. None of them have asked that directly because most people have a hard time answering questions about their risk tolerance. So instead of, you know, asking directly and getting a blank stare, these questions have been proxies that when you look at them in aggregate, help you synthesize the right risk profile for yourself or for your client. The other theme that we covered is around how a well-formed question can educate you, how it can anchor you in responsible investment practices. For instance, a well-designed question make sure that you don't switch strategies based on, you know, a brief conversation with a friend. Question number nine. And finally, we learned implicitly that we should revisit these questions when anything significant changes in our lives. Foreseen or unforeseen, investment planning is like an effective, well-written will. You don't just write one and forget about it, right? You, you have to keep updating it as your life plays out. <clears throat> okay, so that was part one of the walk. I'd like to make part two about what's missing from Robo, the lessons of financial planning that you can't learn because Robo is so narrowly focused on managing your asset allocation. I put the piece of paper in my pocket and throw it away. Um, remember what I said at the beginning of this walk about how Robo just scratches the surface of wealth management? I don't remember my exact words, but it was about how people are so much more than their asset allocation. They need tax planning, estate planning, family planning, education planning. They could all use a good lawyer. Uh, if they're wealthy enough, they, they need good philanthropy planning, more complex tax planning. If they own a business, they need all that plus, plus, plus. That's the difference between the currently narrow focus of robo and the more holistic focus of a human wealth advisor. Can that happen through a robo-advisory type interface? Of course. Does it? Not really. Not at, at the mass consumer level, right? You and me. It's funny, but the, but the super wealthy, what the industry calls ultra high net worth individuals, have something called family offices. Should probably do a whole walk on family offices, but family offices are like a team of people that 
do the things I just described for one family or a small group of families. Why? Quick history. The first family offices in the U.S. were established in the 19th century by a who's who of the, the nation's wealthiest industrialists. They realized that traditional banking and brokerage, which back then was just really, you know, well-dressed men with handlebar mustaches, wasn't, wasn't enough for them. So these masters of the Gilded Age, these tycoons of industry, steel magnets, railroad magnets, refrigerator magnets, chose instead to pay their own teams of experts to oversee their family's finances, a family office. Now, sounds elitist and unnecessary, but to be fair, after you hit a certain level of wealth, you're more of a financial institution from a planning perspective than you are, you know, an average Joe or Jane, an individual. So it actually does make sense. Family offices have flourished since the, the 1980s, Reagan, Reagan's era, since they're, and by the way, they're an excellent measure of income inequality, which has also flourished since ninth, the 1980s and, and Ronald Reagan. What do they do? Family offices, all things wealth management. If you don't have a family office, I don't. You need to talk with your financial planner, your tax guy, your banker, your loans guy, your credit guy, your lawyer, your other lawyer. The list goes on and on and on. And what's wildly frustrating is that you have to connect all those dots. Your financial planner doesn't talk to your tax guy. You talk to both and connect the dots. Your banker doesn't talk to your lawyer. You talk to both and connect the dots. It's enough of a pain that people legit hate to manage their financial lives. What a good family office does is to get all those people talking on your behalf. The family office connects all those dots. They don't, you know, they make it so that you, as the beneficiary, don't talk to 10 people. You talk to one, the family office guy or gal. That's a beautiful thing. Can that happen through a robo-advisory type interface? Of course it can. Does it? Not, not today. But maybe someone listening to this walk can, can make it their side hustle, right? What kind of robo-advisory type questions would a robo-tax service ask? I, I, I call it TurboTax++. Plus plus. All the questions asked by TurboTax when they're just trying to fill out your tax forms, but long before you fill out your tax forms. That's called planning. <laughs> TurboTax doesn't plan. It just jumps into the battlefield and starts shooting, right? It's just like RoboAdvisory was trying to understand your time frames and risk appetite. RoboTax would would focus on your longer term financial goals. But instead of, you know, ending the questionnaire with an asset allocation, like we did at the beginning of this walk, it would tell you how, when, why to deduct, defer, divide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you're, if you're not a t tax plan, planner or tax person, why would you be? I'm not. You can think of tax planning in terms of the five R's, a lot of re-somethings, like the first R, reduce. A tax deduction is, is a provision that reduces taxable income. A standard deduction is, is like a single fixed amount that you keep instead of paying because there's some local, state, or national laws that say you can keep it under that condition. Common examples are like things like mortgage interest from back in the day or charitable contributions. When you contribute, it's tax deductible. Through proper planning, you can actively 
and intentionally create deduction opportunities to claim as many of these deductions or credits as is legally possible. You're not dodging anything. It's legal. As opposed to, you know, waiting until the day before taxes are due and praying that TurboTax will, will save you. That's the first re. I think there's five of them that I wanted to walk through. Second one is like replanning. You, you may be able to, from a tax perspective, legally take your tax bill or a portion of it that would otherwise be owed this year and push it off, defer it to a future year. You're not eliminating the tax. You're just using a legal means to pay it in the future. And that is better than paying it today because you can invest what you would have paid until its, you know, deferred date comes. So that lets you benefit from the, uh, the, the time value of money. What a cute dog. That was the second R. Third R, rethink. You can rethink your tax burden by potentially moving income from the hands of one family member who will pay taxes at a higher rate to another who will pay taxes at a lower rate. There are legal ways to do this by rethinking your income, by dividing up differently, uh, something that's also called income splitting. You can retain more of your income with RoboTax trademark you could own, you and your family could potentially rethink your affairs so that you have equal incomes. I say potentially because this isn't always possible, but RoboTax could, or like RoboCop, RoboTax could help you plan in that direction. Fourth, fourth kind of tax are reframe with, with proper planning you can legally convert one type of income into another type that is subject to lower tax rates, which is important because not all income is taxed equally. The fifth R, restructure. You can make better decision. Well, you can better manage your tax burden by restructuring your affairs so that some of the taxable amounts currently showing up on your tax return might not have to be reported on your tax return going forward. Again, legally, planning can let you move taxable to non-taxable benefits or tax-free cash flows, all legal and all things that, you know, you shouldn't think about the night before your taxes are due as you frantically try to get TurboTax to, you know, get you out of heartburn. We've all heard that some rich people don't pay their, their fair share of taxes. It's not quite that. It, it's that it, it's not that they all turn into Cruella de Vil. They just, they hire smart tax people or family offices who help them push the limits of the law or, you know, push the limits that the law allows. Most of those stories about evil rich people, by the way, are intentional misdirection. The spotlight shouldn't be cast on, the, on their tax planning. It should be cast on their political giving because they support lawmakers and laws that make avoiding taxes the privilege of those who can afford tax specialists. Anywho, another reason, by the way, to do something like robo tax or robo advisor, or actually robo family office. That's, that's what you need. Anywho, those are the five R's and I only went through them. So you'll understand that like asset allocation, which sounds super complex. Tax planning can also be accessible to non-specialists. Instead of the 10 questions that are in my pocket that we asked with Robo Advisory, Robo Family Office could ask questions that add a planning sensibility to the questions like TurboTax asks you every year. 
TurboTax asks, do you own a home you currently reside in? RoboTax would, would ask, do you have plans to change your residence or acquire a new home or fix up your current home in the future? You see, TurboTax looks backwards, RoboTax looks forward. TurboTax asks, do you have health insurance, a health spending account? RoboTax would ask, how do you plan to manage your health and the health of your loved ones, your, your parents over the next decade? Do you, do you need to take care of aging parents? Let's plan this out from a tax perspective, from a financials perspective, not just, you know, how are you going to take care of their health, but how are you going to pay for it? TurboTax asks, are there, are any members of your household attending college right now? Robo would ask, how do you want to manage your children's future education? Have you considered an educational savings account, like a, like a 525, 529 plan? And they, it's a U.S. thing. TurboTax asks, what major life changes happened this past year? Robo would ask, what major life changes do you anticipate in the coming year or years? TurboTax, marriage this year? Divorce? Did you have a baby? Did you adopt? Did you move? Buy a home? Refinance your home? Sell a property? Buy an investment property. Would you start a business? And all of it is looking in the rear view mirror. Robo would look ahead. Every question TurboTax asks you about last year is an opportunity for planning. Did you start a business? Can become, are you planning to start a business? Now, if you worked for Intuit, and I doubt anyone from Intuit's going to watch this, but, you know, the, the makers of TurboTax, you're probably thinking, hey, we try. We make suggestions. We offer ideas. We do our best. And you do, yeah. I get it. My point isn't that TurboTax needs to change. It's that we, average, everyday Joes and Janes, should get the same holistic love that family offices provide ultra high net worth individuals. Tax is one dimension, but so are all the other dimensions we talked about. Estate planning, all the way to education and philanthropy. My point is that if we were given those services, that integration, well, we wouldn't need to separately manage our investments with one company, our taxes with another, our estate with another, our children's education with yet another, parents' health with yet another, so on and so on, so on. Anyone who doesn't have a family office or a robo office for the, for the mass consumer market has to sign on to, you know, financialplanner.com and mytaxguy.com and mybank.com and mylawyer.com and myotherlawyer.com. Anyone who doesn't have a family office or a robo office has to manually connect all these dots. You have to connect to 10 sites instead of connecting to one. And that is the golden ring the next generation of hackers needs to grab. Look, there's more that I could say, but I don't know if you can tell. There's light shining through the trees. It's just beautiful. So I'm going to put this down. I hope you learned something. I'm just going to take in this gorgeous scene. Have a good one.